Most of you, probably all of you, have heard of Murphy's Law. You know, anything that can go wrong will go wrong and usually at the worst possible time. We know that one. But have you ever heard of Morton's Fork? It's not a special eating utensil. It describes a situation that people sometimes find themselves in. In ancient Greek mythology, it was stated as between Scylla and Charybdis. That didn't help either? Okay, okay. Most of us know it today stated as between a rock and a hard place. It describes a situation in which there are two possible outcomes, neither of which are acceptable. That's where the children of Israel found themselves at the end of chapter 4 of our story today. Here they were in a Morton's Fork situation. They had the Red Sea in front of them, the Egyptian army bearing down behind them. Two possible outcomes, neither of which was acceptable. They could either attack Egypt and probably be slaughtered, or they could just surrender and be re-enslaved. And so, finding themselves in this situation between a rock and a hard place, the people of Israel did what they do best during the whole time that they are out in the wilderness. They complained. They complained to Moses. Moses, what have you done? Why have you led us in the desert to die? Why have you led us out here to be slaughtered like animals? We never asked to be rescued from slavery in the first place. And Moses, feeling the wrath of the people and the heat from the people, turns around and complains to God. He prays for deliverance. How did the people of Israel end up in this situation? That's what chapter 4 of the story is about. In chapter 4, we move from the book of Genesis to the book of Exodus. And Exodus begins with a classic understatement that sets the tone for the next 17 chapters. Chapter 1 of Exodus begins near the beginning with this statement. There arose in Egypt a king who knew not Joseph. You remember Joseph from last week. Joseph, the one who helped Egypt prepare for the coming famine, who saved Egypt and practically the whole Middle East there from starvation. Joseph, who made Egypt a wealthy nation because they had grain to sell. Joseph, who made Egypt into an economic powerhouse. There arose a king, a new dynasty. Amenhotep was out, the house of Ramses was in. And they did not remember Joseph. So when the house of Ramses looked around the kingdom of Egypt and saw the multitude of Hebrews that lived within its borders, instead of recognizing the people who enabled them to become wealthy, Ramses saw a threat. These people could rebel and kick me out from being Pharaoh. So to control the people, he enslaves them. But that really doesn't control the people very much at all. They keep multiplying, and the number of people keep growing. So he institutes male infanticide, killing that firstborn male. But all that did was made the Israelites more cunning and more resilient. They started hiding the firstborn infants, like Moses, who was hidden in the reeds along the river, Found by one of Pharaoh's daughters, who adopts him as his own, raises Moses in the courts of Pharaoh. And as Moses grew in years, he remembered his heritage, that he was a Hebrew. So that one day when he saw an uh, Egyptian overlord beating a Hebrew slave, he goes and kills the Egyptian. When Pharaoh finds out, he becomes infuriated. He sends Moses off into the desert with just a little water and food, knowing that he would die out in that desert. 
But Moses, at the end of his life's robe, comes across a flock of sheep guarded by women. And when rustlers come along to try to steal those sheep, Moses fights off the rustlers. The women take Moses back to their father's tent, the nomad Jethro, a Midianite. Jethro welcomes him into the tent. It's while Moses was serving Jethro that God calls him on Mount Sinai. God calls to him from a bush that appears to be burning, but doesn't burn. And God says to Moses, I have heard the cries of my people in, Israel, in Egypt and the suffering that they are going through. And I have chosen you to be the one who leads them out of Egypt, frees them from slavery. And Moses tries to come up with all kinds of excuses not to go. Um, who should I say sent me? Would they even know who you are? Um, I'm a nobody. I have no powers. Um, I have no army to fight Pharaoh. How am I supposed to do this? And then he comes up with one final excuse, one that we often use. Um, I'm not good at public speaking. I wouldn't know what to say. But God would have none of it. He said, Aaron, your brother, will be your mouthpiece. Imagine the shock and surprise of Pharaoh when this guy that he had sent out into the desert to die appears before him in the court and demands the release of his free workforce. <laughs> what king's going to let his free workforce go? Of course Pharaoh laughs at Moses. And thus begins the battle between the God of Israel and the gods of Egypt. That's the way it's interpreted. When armies fought with each other of different nations, it was the armies of, of controlled by the gods of that nation against the armies of the gods of this nation battling each other. And we know what happens in the plague. And the plague that finally breaks Pharaoh's back was when the firstborn of all living animals was killed in the land of Egypt. The only way a firstborn was saved is if they were in a house on which the doorposts and the crossbeams were painted with the blood of a perfect one-year-old male lamb. When the angel of death saw that, the angel of death would pass over that house, which is why the celebration became known as the Passover. When Pharaoh discovered his own son's death, and when he heard the cries of the people all across Egypt at the death of their firstborn sons, that was enough. Pharaoh said, get out. Immediately, leave, scram. We don't want you anymore. But soon, the shock of that death turns into anger. Pharaoh wants his workforce back. So he sends his army after the Israelites who had packed up their belongings and were headed to Canaan. The Egyptian army catches up to them where we, find, where we found them at the beginning of the sermon. The Red Sea in front of them, the Egyptian army bearing down behind them between a rock and a hard place. Our Old Testament lesson tells us what happened. The people complain to Moses. Moses complains to God. God scolds Moses for not trusting him and tells his people, relax, I will rescue you. Moses raises his staff over the waters of the Red Sea. The Red Sea parts to the left and to the right. They have a gr dry ground path in front of them. They march through the middle of the Red Sea. The Egyptian army pursues them down that same path. And when the Egyptians were in the middle of the sea, God closes it in on them and kills the Egyptian army. God rescued his people. God delivered his people. He kept his promise. He preserved a nation. This story 
continues on some of the themes that we have heard in the previous chapters. Like, for instance, did Israel really deserve to be rescued? Hardly. They were a bunch of complainers and mumblers. They complained about everything. You know, why did you lead us in the desert? They complained about God's navigational skills. Why are you not taking us the short way? Why are we going the long way around to Canaan? They even lied. God, we never asked to be rescued from slavery in the first place. Oh, they'd only been complaining about it for 300 years, but they never ask. No, they didn't deserve to be rescued. Just like Abraham didn't deserve to be chosen, just like Joseph didn't deserve what he was given. But again, this story illustrates to us the essence of our God. Our true God is a God of love, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love for his people. God's desire is to rescue, to deliver his people. It's that deliverance that we want to focus on today. You see, the Old Testament is really setting up the stage for the New Testament. What happens in the Old Testament is sort of like a precursor of what's going to happen in, in the New Testament. And in this chapter of, of um, of the story, the fourth chapter of the story, we have really two events that sort of set the stage for events that happen in the New Testament. One with which we're very familiar and one not so much so. The one with which we're familiar is the Passover event. You know, the Passover is the anti-type, A-N-T-E type, not A-N-T-I type. It is the precursor, foreshadowing of the sacrament of Holy Communion. Jesus makes that explicit there in the upper room on Monday Thursday when he says, I'm establishing a new covenant with you. One, not in the blood of a one-year-old male lamb, but in my blood. Of that blood which will rescue the sins of all people for all time. We get that one. But it's this Red Sea crossing that's also an antitype. It is the antitype to baptism. Being saved, rescued, delivered by passing through the water. Here in this story, God again sets up the archetype of his grace and mercy. God gives grace and mercy not because it is earned or deserved, but because it's his desire to save all people. Think about the connections here. Think about your baptism. What did you do to earn God's grace when you were baptized? What did you bring when you were brought to the waters of holy baptism? Most of us were mere infants at the time, totally dependent, having nothing to bring. And your spiritual condition before baptism, you spiritually were also between a rock and a hard place. Because we are all born with that inherited sin, that fallenness of humanity, we found ourselves between the wrath of God Almighty, which we deserve because of our sin, and the armies of Satan who wanted to keep us enslaved in that sin. Two possible outcomes, neither one of them acceptable. But then God comes to us. We pass through the waters of holy baptism and we are delivered from the slavery of sin. We are given new life, made new creations in Christ and promised the gift of eternal life, the promised land. When you're reading these stories in the Old Testament, you know about the surface story. You find out about how the Hebrews found themselves in Egypt and how they were rescued from slavery in Egypt. But the eyes of faith see the sub-story going on, God's reality going on, the unfolding of salvation history.
Even the life of Jesus is set up in the Old Testament as Jesus relives the life of God's chosen people in his life. Jesus is Israel reduced to one. Just as Mary and Joseph escaped from the land of, of Israel to Egypt to escape Herod, so did the people of Israel have to escape Israel during the famine to live in Egypt. As the people of Israel were called out of Egypt to the promised land, so Mary and Joseph and Jesus were called out of Egypt at the death of Herod. As the people of Israel passed through the Red Sea and thus began their new life, so at Jesus' baptism, it begins his new ministry, a ministry that would lead to our rescue as well. That's what God wants us to see happening in this story, the unfolding of his salvation history for us. God's desire is to deliver his people. That's why Martin Luther stresses so much that we, to, that we daily remember our baptisms. Daily we are to remember that we are mere beggars of God's grace. Daily we approach the throne of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, laying before that throne our grumblings, our complaining, our sin. Daily we acknowledge that we bring nothing good before God. And daily we remember our baptism, that we have passed through the water and there washed clean of our sins, rescued from the slavery to sin, given the gift of new life. Daily we remember that we are new creations in Christ Jesus, made that way through the passing through the waters. Daily we enter the world and bless the world through our service as God has blessed us through the service of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why baptism is important. That's why we remember it daily because in that baptism, we were delivered. As Titus says, or Peter says, baptism now saves you. So in remembrance of our baptism, remembering the blessings that God poured out on us that day, we stand and recite together our baptismal remembrance.